Welcome, and thanks for having me present. Today, I'm going to discuss a natural case study of high strain melt migration pathways through the lower crust. This work was done with my collaborator, Sandra Piazzolo, from the University of Leeds and our PhD and master's students. High strain zones are classified with a broad division between brittle versus ductile deformation mechanisms. For this presentation, I use myelinite in the broad sense where modern usage of the term implies crystal plastic deformation in the solid state. Our research has focused on high strain rocks that deform in the presence of melt, and in particular where melt has migrated along high strain zones into and through subsolidus rocks that previously didn't contain melt. We call these high strain rocks melphorite. For the first part of the presentation, I'll contrast myelinite versus melphorite. Then I'll present a natural case study of melphorite in lower arc crust from New Zealand and finish with showing you what happens to zircon in the rocks as melt migrates through and reacts within these high strain zones. This is a classic myelinite from the Himalaya. The key features are a bimodal grain size distribution where there is a fine matrix of dynamically recrystallized grains. Porphyroclasts show internal deformation microstructures. Contrast this photomicrograph of a typical myelinite with the microstructure in a melphorite high strain zone that we've studied shown on the next slide. The microstructure of melt fluxed high strain zones or melphorite have unimodal grain size distribution and lack most other features common to typical myelinite. The key microstructural characteristic of melphorite and high strain zones of former melt flux are abundant microstructures indicative of the former presence of melt. These are summarized on the next slide. This summary figure is from our 2022 review paper and shows a range of microstructures indicative of the former presence of melt. We observe these in melphorite high strain rocks, with the most common being A, faceted grains, interpreted to have grown against a melt film or pocket. B shows interstitial texture involving grains with highly irregular shapes. C are grains that subtend apparent low dihedral angles. These are typically less than 60 degrees and are inferred to have pseudomorphed to melt. D are a neighborhood of small grains that share the same crystallographic orientation, indicating that they are likely branching single crystals connected in 3D and we interpret that these have pseudomorphed a grain boundary melt network. We recognize the same crystallographic orientation in EBSD data or looking at similar extinction angles of multiple grains. E highlights extremely long grains that are inferred to have pseudomorphed a grain boundary melt film. All of these delicate microstructures are consistent with melt present deformation within our high strain zones during the formation of the melphorite. Fiordland New Zealand is a natural laboratory where we can study melt migration pathways and melphorite high strain rocks because the deep lower crustal root of a magmatic arc is very well exposed. We see little retrograde or deformation overprint during exhumation and there are lots of these melt flux high strain zones or melphorite rocks that have formed. The studied melphorite high strain zones deform these precursor rocks. These involve gabbroic gneiss, the grey coloured rock, that's cut by a spectacular grid pattern of thin feldspar-rich dikelets with adjacent garnet reaction zones. These provide an excellent strain marker as well as a reaction marker during subsequent deformation and melt rock interaction. The gabbroic gneiss shows evidence for solid state deformation such as undulose extinction and dynamically recrystallized grains. The precursor rocks, the gabbroic gneiss and garnet granulite reaction zones, are deformed and hydrated within narrow meter scale high strain zones of melphorite. These convert the granulite to amphibolite. We observe both steeply and shallowly dipping high strain zones, but we rarely see recognizable igneous components in our crop. These might be leucosome lenses or syntectonic dikes inside the high strain zones. At the outcrop scale, we see compositional banding, a fabric gradient as we approach the high strain zone, 
we see a change in colour, change in grain size, a new foliation and lineation, as well as bending of the old Nisosity and Garnet reaction zones into the new fabric. Together, these all indicate we have a ductile high strain zone. At the micro scale, these melphorite high strain zones don't look like typical myelinites. In contrast, they show abundant microstructural indicators of the former presence of melt, such as very elongate grains that may terminate with apparent low dihedral angles. The microstructures coupled with extensive hydration to infibrolite indicate migration and reactive flow of a hydrous melt was key to forming the melphorite high strain zones. The largest of these high strain zones is 30 to 40 meters wide, and rather than amphibolite, it is dominated by hornblendite and minor garnetite. Panels B, C, and D show the progressive replacement of the earlier formed rocks towards the high strain zone and into the high strain zone. You can see the grid pattern of garnet reaction zones in A are replaced by hornblendite in D. The garnet reaction zones are replaced by garnetite. Panel E shows pegmatitic igneous components at the outcrop scale, where there is coarse amphibol shown by the white arrows, plagioclase by the red arrows, and garnet by the yellow arrows. The rare earth element pattern of the precursor gabbroic gneiss is modified and generally enriched during the reactive flow of hydrous melt. This rare earth element metasomatism along with the outcrop scale evidence of an igneous pegmatitic component within the high strand zone and microstructures as previously discussed, together this all indicates that the system was open and that melt must have been the most likely source of water in the hydration reaction because rare earth elements are much more mobile in melt than they are in aqueous fluids. To summarize the key characteristics of melphorite, field observations of High strain zones rich in leucosome lenses and dikes are commonly used to infer melt present deformation and a former melt transfer zone through the crust. However, field observations may not always show a recognizable igneous component. Therefore, microstructures are important, and we found that these are not typical of classic myelinite rocks and include microstructures that are indicative of the former presence of melt. An interesting point here is that the observed melt pseudomorphs must crystallize at the end of the deformation story in order to be preserved in the rock. This implies that once the melt crystallizes, the rock becomes rheologically hard, such that those delicate melt pseudomorph microstructures are preserved through to today. Chemically, we observe hydration to form the amphibole clinozoazite and biotite in this New Zealand case study, and we see evidence for rare earth element mobility and metasomatism. The third part of the presentation examines how the melt that is migrating through a melphorite high strain zone interacts with zircon grains in the precursor gabbroic gneiss, and also the precursor zircons in the dikes and the garnet reaction zones. Starting here with the gabbroic gneiss, we observe sector zoning in cathodoluminescence images of the zircon grains, and these grains are clear in backscattered electron images. Uranium lead geochronology indicates the gabbro crystallized at about 132 million years ago and rare earth element patterns are pretty typical for zircon. Within the dikes, we observe sector zoning and faint oscillatory zoning in cathodoluminescence images of the zircon grains, and those zircon grains are pretty clean in backscattered electron images. Uranium lead geochronology indicates the dikes cut the gabbroic gneiss at about 123 million years, showing that the precursor rocks to our melphorite high strain zones had a relatively short 10 million year long geological history in which for them to form. Rare earth element patterns of zircon from the dikes are depleted in heavy rare earth elements compared to the host gabbroic gneiss and there's a lack of a europium anomaly. The reduced heavy rare earth elements is likely due to co-crystallization of garnet in the dikes competing for those heavy rare earth elements. Before I move on to show you modified zircon grains in the garnet reaction zones and the melphorite high strain zones, I will give some background to the process of coupled dissolution precipitation. This process is driven by the relative solubility of minerals in a fluid. And so any mineral will dissolve if the fluid is undersaturated with respect to that mineral. As soon as it starts to dissolving, local saturation in a boundary layer fluid will occur at that interface 
because the process just dissolved components of the mineral into the boundary layer fluid. This ultra-local saturation of the boundary fluid then drives precipitation. The reaction migrates inwards into the reactant mineral via porosity in the new minerals. Porosity being an integral part of the coupled dissolution coupled dissolution precipitation process. It maintains an open chemical connection between the bulk fluid that's driving the process and the reactant grain interface. The process of coupled dissolution precipitation needs to be contrasted with volume diffusion because researchers who use geochronology think about closure temperatures of an isotopic system in terms of volume diffusion. Diffusion happens in the absence of a fluid. It has a high activation energy and therefore happens at higher temperatures. The components move within the crystal lattice and there's no destruction of the framework, which means the rates are quite low for most silicates. In contrast, for coupled dissolution precipitation, the fluid lowers activation energies. Coupled dissolution precipitation is very fast and it involves the three steps of dissolving, transporting over variable scales, and then precipitation. The scales of transport of trace elements such as radiogenic lead are likely important in whether the age of a modified domain of zircon, for example, is reset, or it may experience variable lead loss. Our research question is whether the coupled dissolution precipitation process is common in minerals like zircon that we use for geochronology. We often see complex textures in cathodoluminescence like is shown in this zircon with a ghosted rim. Our interpretation of these rims is that at the interface of the fluid zircon reaction, the dissolution of those zircon components includes its uranium and lead isotopic character, such that when the new zircon precipitates in coupled dissolution precipitation, it inherits or partly copies the uranium lead isotopic character. Although the grain has been modified, it's been structurally broken down and regrown, there is a question as to whether the age resets to zero. This depends on the connectivity of the fluid at the interface and the bulk fluid that's driving the process. The cartoon on the lower right shows that chemical communication happens through the microporosity in the modified domain. If the connectivity is high, then there's a good chance the radiogenic lead and or other trace elements like the rare earths can escape and we might reset the age of our rim domain and change its trace element chemistry. If the connectivity is low, then we inherit the old trace element signature and uranium lead isotopic character. As such, the age does not reset to zero. We infer that this process creates complex age patterns like is shown in the upper right, where near concordant data points smear between two ages. This is over a few hundred million years in this example shown from the Mawson Chartakite in Antarctica. Note that microstructural evidence of the very fine porosity is very difficult to see in cathodoluminescence images, and it requires high resolution backscattered electron imaging to see the porosity. To summarize, the key microstructural evidence for modification of zircon by coupled dissolution precipitation are modification and truncation of internal textures observed in cathodoluminescence, preservation of porosity and epigenetic inclusions that are best observed in backscattered electron imaging. Now, returning to our case study in New Zealand, the zircon grains from the garnet reaction zones that formed adjacent to these little felsic dikelets, they show highly irregular shapes consistent with dissolution of parts of the grains. Internal to the zircon, there is spectacular preservation of fine porosity that is distributed and coarser porosity that forms trails. Some pores are filled with epigenetic mineral inclusions. Uranium lead geochronology indicates that zircon in the garnet reaction zones have ages that are smeared over 10 to 15 million years, between that of the original gabbro and a little bit younger than the age of the dikes. Rare earth element patterns of the zircon from the garnet reaction zones are most similar to grains from the host gabbro gneiss, but do show minor modification or subtle depletion in the heavy rare earth elements as garnet was growing in these reaction zones. Zircon grains from the milpharite high strain zones show highly irregular shapes. These are consistent with dissolution of parts of the grains from multiple sides. The surface of these dissolved regions shows a pitted texture 
that connects to internal microstructures that include fine porosity and trails that we can see in these BSE images. The most extremely modified zircon grains from the Milfrite high strain zones are crisscrossed by many dissolution channels. In between these channels, throughout the whole grain, there is spectacular preservation of fine porosity that is distributed and in trails. Some pores are filled with epigenetic mineral inclusions. Uranium-led geochronology indicates that zircon in the Melphorite high strain zones have ages that are smeared over 15 to 20 million years, between that of the original gabbro down to about 105 million years. Rare earth patterns of zircon from the Melphorite high strain zones are the most depleted in the heavy rare earth elements. This indicates that the rare earth elements were more mobile than the radiogenic lead during coupled dissolution precipitation process, such that the rare earth patterns were modified strongly, while the uranium lead ages were variably disturbed rather than cleanly reset to the age of the Melphorite high strain zone. In addition, the green lines on the rare earth element plot are from four grains that have ages between 400 and 600 million years. We interpret that the hydrous melt migrating through the high strain zones carried Xenocris with it and impregnated some of these foreign zircon grains into the Milphorite high strain rocks. The take home messages of this presentation are that Mylonite and Milphorite are strongly distinguished based on their characteristic microstructures. An interpretation of a Milphorite high strain zone can be supported by field observation of igneous components within the high strain zone along with evidence of reactive flow and rare earth element mobility and metasomatism. Within those high strain zones, melt zircon interaction can modify the zircon grains. And this happens by a coupled dissolution precipitation, which can be inferred by observation of modified and truncated CL textures and preservation of porosity and epigenetic inclusions. The coupled dissolution precipitation process variably mobilizes the radiogenic lead, leading to smears of age data over a few tens of millions of years, but may be better at depleting and modifying the rare earth element patterns of zircon, indicating that different trace elements have different mobilities during the process. Thank you.